so much. Thank you. Okay, if you can, there we are. All right, technology actually works. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here this afternoon. Um, this is going to be sort of a rubber meets the road session in terms of trying to talk about the exigencies and the, the specifics of how our gambling treatment court is run in Amherst, New York, and maybe some of the analogies that can be drawn for purposes of use in any one of your areas or countries that because the problems are all the same. I was particularly appreciative of our prior keynote speaker talking about how the characterization of gamblers is that they are bad people because that's exactly what society does and that's exactly what my brethren on the bench do and it's exactly what prosecutors do. So I'm very pleased to be here. As you can see I don't do PowerPoint uh, screens very well because the things are offline and when I had my assistant help me she got my first communion picture in the upper left hand corner. So you know as you can see things have changed but what we're going to do today, and I'm going to go fairly quickly because this normally runs a lot longer than the allotted hour, but I'll try to go through this as quickly as possible, try to make it in such a way to understand that the concepts are general in nature. And um, those who know me know that I have been very, very involved in therapeutic courts and therapeutic justice for 20 years. I've been running a drug court for 20 years. I was running a gambling treatment court for just about 13 and been running a uh, combat veterans treatment court. So um, that all ended January 1 when I retired. And since I've retired, I've had a tough gig. Two weeks in the Virgin Islands and two weeks here. So I'm beginning to like the retirement aspect and especially I was talking with Graham and I have so many uh, so many places to go. Um, my sin is I love good wine, and one of the things I'd like to do in my retirement is become certified as a sommelier. Uh, at least it gives me that goal to go after. But uh, that's, that's something of personal recreation. What we're doing here today is to try to talk a little bit about gambling treatment court. And our, our goals are to understand the interface between the substance abusing compulsive gambler and the criminal justice system. And I use the term substance abusing gambler because of the people that were in my court, 90% of them had a problem of some nature and some degree with drugs and alcohol. So I took the liberty of doing that. We'll talk about the types of criminal activity, the descriptive characteristics of these folks, and as I just mentioned, the comorbidity. I'm gonna compare the traditional criminal justice system. It'll be the United States criminal justice system, but the analogies are very, very similar in terms of how all courts that function under a concept of due process and procedure generally operate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our societal perceptions in the United States, which are, as I alluded to at the beginning, uh, that problem gamblers or gamblers in general are bad people. Uh, they need to be punished uh, and that it's a character flaw. Uh, once you get beyond that educated point of view, you see where the problem is. And we'll talk a little bit about what we've done in Amherst in terms of our origin, the nature of our operations, statistics, and some of our programmatic recognitions and challenges after 13 years of existence. Pre-2013, and by the way, how many here are familiar with DSM? Diagnostic, everybody knows it. It's like the Bible. Well, as you can see, before 2013, uh, you've all seen this description of what categorizes or what describes a pathological gambler. disorder psychologically uncontrolled preoccupation, willing to have all sorts of carnage in their lives. Then the folks sat down and decided we need to change that because it was a disease of impulse control. Now as a disease of impulse control, it also did not qualify uh, for any insurance coverage whatsoever. It still doesn't, but the bottom line is it's getting a little better under DSM-5 because now it's a substance-related disorder uh, with a category of behavioral addictions. I found that many places around the world are a tad more progressive than the United States in terms of at least recognizing it as an illness, having a governmental entity or commission or ministry to be able to deal with the problem, and at the same sense to, to look at what this is and possibly provide the uh, medical care and assistance that's so desperately needed. Uh, the changes in DSM-5, we used to have five criteria out of the ten standard ones from the South Oaks gambling screen. Now it's down to four. And for some strange reason that I can't understand yet, they've eliminated the necessity of an illegal act as part of the definition. 
Now, this is those 10 factors. You've all seen them. You all know what they are. Under, when we started our gambling court, and we knew absolutely nothing about this field, I started it because I saw a confluence of people over a three or four week period of time that had what looked to be an addictive process but wasn't strictly something we would have put in drug court for drugs or alcohol. The suggestion was made that it was possibly gambling, uh, about which I knew nothing. So we brought in the experts and some people from Jewish Family Services, which was the only certified agency at that time, and we began to say, well, we can apply the drug court model. We can apply the same protocol. Now, here's where I'm going to ask you to start thinking. You have drug court here in Auckland. You have the protocol in place. So keep that in mind as we go on. So outside of what needing five of these before, we now only need four. And they add the additional that if the gambling behavior was accompanied by a manic episode, that it might be better to look at that diagnosis of mania as opposed to gambling. Again, a refinement that represented the conflict that was occurring academically between those in the drug and alcohol field, the mental health field, and the gambling field to try to redefine what was going on. DSM-5, as you all know, is not uniformly accepted. In fact, one of the major NIH, the National Institute of Health, will not fund anything based on a diagnosis uh, using the DSM-5 criteria. So again, very progressive. Uh, types of gamblers, again, we needed to understand these basic points, action gambler versus escape gambler, typical gender orientation, uh, but currently, as we all know, everything is turned around in the world and this no longer really applies. The risk factors we had in terms of looking at people, the types of people coming in the courthouse that involve themselves in near misses, risk taking, sensation seeking, unhealthy coping skills. Uh, they had psychiatric conditions, low self esteem, competitiveness. We hear the concept in the discussion now of possible genetic predisposition. This is not something that I have the requisite degree of expertise to be able to comment upon. Uh, it is a growing argument. I'm married to a geneticist, and I, as I mentioned in one of the workshops, I'd better have the hardcore evidence before I talk about that ever, ever again in terms of saying there's a genetic predisposition. But the discussion is ongoing. Uh, other risk factors, disorder in thinking, because people we see in a courthouse, and remember, judges and court staff know nothing about this, about the underpinnings of somebody's problems, except what they see or what they, they experience, or what the prosecutor or the defense attorney says or what the defendant admits. So getting familiar with in a therapeutic or restorative justice setting to be sensitive to what kinds of disorders this person have, denial, overconfidence, sense of power and control. You've got to do screens to come up with this. You've got to be able to access the information and use it intelligently thereafter. The belief that money is the cause and solution to all problems. In our area, gambling and the amount of people that were present in our courthouse became directly related to the availability of gambling, more casinos, more racinos, more ability for sports betting, product variety, different types of games. Now all your friends are going to the casino. Now there's a support system of people who use the casino as their entertainment site. Uh, excessive life stressors. We're in very di difficult economic times. And as we discussed in our workshop the other day, they're building casinos right in the middle of the most deprived areas so that people can actually decide that they will spend their money for food and go in an attempt to re restore their lives. Uh, lack of life structure, there's more access to credit, dysfunctional families. And I'm going to go through these, through these fairly quickly because they are basic concepts. With a dysfunctional family, which when you run a drug court, you see an awful lot of enabling parents. When you, you see an awful lot of family members that don't quite want to adopt or recognize or accept the fact that their loved one has a problem. And you see young people, and I say young people, but we've had people all the way up in drug court from 16 to, to 65 or 70, and the same thing with gambling court. But dysfunctional families, whatever the age bracket, seem to have a very strong contributive factor in terms of what we see in the courtroom itself. Uh, abuse, inconsistent parenting, emotionally distant or absent parents, giving the child 25, 50, 100 bucks and saying, go do what you want this weekend. We've got some parties to go to or whatever that might be, or parents that, that are suffering from their children being distinctly rebellious and coming into me as a judge, as I mentioned again in the workshop, and saying, my, I can't control my child. What are you going to do about it, judge? And 
as I said, I don't have the requisite degrees to do it, but we make parents part of the solution. But the dysfunctional family, whether it be drug court or gambling court or whatever it might be, has a strong element of contribution. The problem-solving courts themselves, the reason that when we approach trying to expand this concept or this idea, the singular issue is a judicial dilemma. Because if you don't have a judge that wants to run a court of this nature, you're not going anywhere. Because judges have an amazing amount of, of discretion. Even as we begin to see the plethora of therapeutic courts that have come upon the scene. When I started my drug court, I was the 29th drug court in the United States. There's now 4,700. Uh, when, I, when we started our domestic violence court uh, within uh, a year after that, there was no other uh, domestic violence court. When I started the gambling court, it remains the only one in the world. And when I did veterans court, there were very few in the country. The idea behind it is that now you have bureaucratic overlays that now as we get involved with thousands of therapeutic courts and all the 50 chief judges of all the states in the United States endorsing them, now the typical reaction that, that always happens is when government sees something there, they set up another bureaucratic level to monitor it. And that's what we have. So we have judges that may have a little less discretion, but still in all, the decision to do this is basically theirs. And so what they have to do is makes, make a commitment to therapeutics. They have to decide whether they're going to do things in a traditional way or the therapeutic way, the old versus the new, looking at do we, how do we protect society, do I need to take a deterrent and punitive point of view with punishment, or can I involve myself in therapeutics? The costs of doing this. Well, the costs, as we talked about again in our workshop earlier, was the fact that if you incarcerate somebody in the United States, it's about 50 to 60,000 a year in a good year. Uh, with therapeutic courts, your costs maybe are seven to 10,000 a year. Even if you don't have any human kindness in your system at all, and you're just a bean counter, you can see the basic benefit of getting involved in therapeutic justice. So, and politics have a, a large part to say in it because drugs and alcohol, uh, people can get with it, they can, get, they can involve themselves with it. But gambling, uh, in the United States at least, the biggest partner of gambling, and I won't use the term gaming, uh, gambling is government, makes up for economic shortfalls. So what's the impetus to get involved in setting up gambling courts? Uh, so judges have to make a decision of what they're going to do, and if they're approached by a community group that says we need to make an inroad, whether it be drug court or gambling court, they have to decide, am I going to buy into the diversionary theory of justice where we take somebody at arraignment, divert them into a therapeutic court, or am I going to do it tra the traditional way, which is arraign them, get them counsel, they talk with the prosecutor, you know, a year goes by, they go to plea or trial, nothing is done therapeutically during that period of time. You have to understand that with these three theories of, of justice, rehabilitative versus punitive versus deterrent, you've got a lot of issues at stake. Politically, people are, as they read their newspapers, they want to know that everybody that embezzled five dollars goes to jail for 275 years. Uh, because that's what we do. And judges are affected by that because many of our judges in the United States are elected and they try to have that fiction that they're isolated from the rest of society. No way. So the idea behind that is that your judge has to make a commitment to what is the essence of what I'm doing here as a judge. Now, the U.S. Department of Justice, and I commend if you want to take a look at the seminal discussion of how you mass assets, take on a whole new team approach to therapeutics, reorganize the courtroom, the 10 key components at that website will give you the the basis of why the U.S. Justice Department and the National Association of Drug Court Treatment Professionals embarked upon this in 1989. The philosophical genesis of this is basically that we're going to restore people to human dignity. We're going to do something different. We're, we're going to break a little China here instead of people coming through the courthouse as a revolving door. I mentioned the other day again in the, in the workshop that the history of, of drug courts, which is the predicate for gambling court, is that in 1989 in Dade County, Florida, the district attorney of that particular county, she was a woman who saw the fact that crime was continuing to continue, was continuing to happen on an ever-increasing basis, and there needed to be something changed because the courts couldn't handle the influx. So she called together probation, welfare, uh, mental health, drug providers, alcohol providers, uh, people involved in prosecution, parole, probation, and they decided 
we have to do it differently. We're going to set up a therapeutic court, judicially monitored, contract-based, with the focus being therapeutics, but with a heavy hammer if the person doesn't uh, comply. As I said the other day, she didn't go on to do much after that. Her name was Janet Reno and became Attorney General of the United States. So the, there was an impetus to do this, and those courts began to proliferate around the United States and around the world. Uh, and that's possibly one of the things that, as Americans, we're very happy we were able to do. This. Uh, lately, we don't seem to be able to send a lot of things that are that good across the ocean, but uh, one of the things we did do is start drug courts, and that concept, thankfully, in terms of human dignity, has expanded. The varieties of courts. We have therapeutic courts now that deal with virtually most, if not all, of your, of your problems. And it may seem almost comical that you're doing that, but they are amazingly successful. Drug courts, juvenile drug courts, family drug courts, DWI courts, that's driving while intoxicated, gambling court, mine, Native American community courts, mental health courts, sex courts, shoplifting courts, veterans treatment courts. And the idea behind it is that you're dealing with uh, and those who think that sex courts may be a little bit different, that's for the disease of impulse control, prostitution, and some of those aspects. In actually a couple of cities, they have that with a population that is, that is attuned to being involved in that type of activity. I mean, I looked at it askance too, but the concept remains the same. You get by the initial label and you see that what's being done is again to address a problem. The structure of these courts are team, approach. We have all the factors, probation, we have uh, public assistance, we have prosecution, defense, providers, mental health, drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever it might be. They are a team that screens all of the participants, but it's judicially supervised. The final decision has to be mine as the judge. Ethically it does, legally it does, and the only way the court has an element of consistency to it is if that takes place. The protocol is that the DA's approved diversion it's a contractually based uh, uh, court, which means people sign a contract whereby they're going to agree to participate, and if they're waiving a lot of their constitutional rights, and if they don't, there's pretty set rules and regulations of what's going to happen to them. We spell out what constitutes noncompliance in the court very specifically. They sign it, and they also understand the progressive lists of sanctions that could occur if they don't participate. The commitment is to accept the disease-based model. That's Thing that has to be understood. You have drug courts here, so there is an acceptance of that. But in some areas, the judiciary doesn't accept the disease-based model. The judge is a benevolent despot because you're dealing with people, some of them have been arrested 40, 50, 60 times. They're at the bottom of the barrel, and they will try to please the judge and provide some degree of showing that they're able to do something with their lives uh, in an element to restore themselves. So that concept of being a benevolent despot is something we laughed about to a certain extent to begin with, but the concept in drug court and in gambling court is a measure of theater. It's a court, it's also sometimes looks like an AA meeting, and the other times it, it does look as if the judge is the all-powerful dictator. Well, we tend to be, but the bottom line is you can do it in a way that's constructive. We have a team. We have the providers, we have all the other people I outline, we coordinate the prosecution and defense. They actually talk to each other. And they actually cooperate. And we have case conferences before every court session. And we have situations where some, some participant may not be doing that well, but there may be some reasons for it. And I've actually been in meetings where the prosecutor said, look, we gotta give this person a break. And the assigned defense counsel said, the hell with a break, they go to jail for a week. <laughs> so uh, it does change things. Uh, if you're going to plan one of these things, you have to have your outpatient facilities, you have to train your providers and your court staff. We run a retreat every year that allows all the different types of providers and all the court staff to share what each other does so that they work as a team because court personnel have no idea what providers do. And providers in the drug and alcohol field sometimes have no idea what the gambling treatment people do. And the mental health people don't listen to either one of them. So uh, the bottom line is if you don't have that kind of a common language, you're not going to get anything. We have mandatory things. We orient every participant in the program. After they're arraigned, they go to a session where they're told for several hours, this is what you're going to do. This is the kinds of things that people ask questions about. What don't you understand about your charge, what the judge is giving you an opportunity? That's the key, an opportunity to do with drug court. 
And so we don't get the question later on, Judge, I didn't know I couldn't do that. So that's part of it. We always have a, an awareness of due process. Any of these arrangements that people have to get in drug court is in accordance with due process. They have a lawyer. The lawyer discusses the diversion with the DA because if, it, if a plea or a verdict hasn't occurred, uh, the DA is the gatekeeper. The DA decides whether the case is diverted to a therapeutic court. Uh, and so that protection is there. Now, the court is non-adversarial, contract-based, rehabilitative. We have set protocols and rules. There's consistency. If somebody violates and there's not a real good legal excuse for it, I don't care if they're a 70-year-old woman and a 20-year-old guy, they're going to get the same punishment. And they're going to go to jail for the week if that happens to be the appropriate response as a sanction. If I don't do that, drug court is very much like this room here. I'll do 180 cases in an afternoon in drug court, maybe from noon till about 8 o'clock at night. Now, if you were to come up, being the upstanding man that you are, and you were to tell me you did this and did that, and there's a reason why you weren't compliant. And I go, really? Well, that's, that's wonderful, and I'll, I'm going to give you a break. I won't sanction you. You may have to go to some, you know, do some community service or do something like that, but I'm not going to put you to jail. What do you think the other 179 people are going to do with a similar type of situation? They're going to say, Judge, you gave him a break. So why not give me a break? Uh, so the consistency has to be there. Otherwise, not only does the court not function, but the expectations of the participant is not there, and that's important. Toughness, compassion, open-mindedness. Judges have to understand the addiction and the gambler. There is another big threshold, because that's something I didn't understand to begin with. Only by trial and error did I get it. And now trying to get this into the minds of other judges who might be considering doing this or judges that don't run a therapeutic court and they're being given information concerning a defendant that has a gambling problem. But in this context, if, if a judge is going to start a court, they've got to understand the addiction. They have to understand the carnage. They have to under listen to the experts that provide the basic information to help the judge in the court. Identification is the most singularly difficult problem in gambling court. Because unlike drug court, there's no p-test in gambling court. So you're dealing with whole bunches of, of subjective information. Was there a DWI here? Was there petty larceny? Uh, does he have a job? Is there some inf information coming from his business associates? Uh, is there some problem with the family going on? Has he made any admissions or she? So again, the job at initial triage at arraignment is to put all these things together, then give it to the certified uh, assessors so that they can do a more in-depth study and you got to be creative now screening issues multiple addictions people come in in our court they've got drug problems alcohol problems everybody has a mental health problem including the court staff and so as a result we've got all sorts of issues at play at the same time the co-occurring disorders will mask a diagnosis and you got issues of the types of defendants youthful defendants 16 to 21 or 25 got to be handled in a certain way. Domestic violence victims uh, or perpetrators, and they need to be triaged because our domestic violence court is really not a therapeutic court. It's a protection of the victim type of court. Veterans, all sorts of issues with them. I brought this statistic up the other day. Uh, combat veterans coming back in the United States have a lot of drug and alcohol problems, a lot of PS P PTSD problems. In addition to that, gambling has become rampant. And the reason why is, that, and I said this again, I, forgive me for those who are at the workshop, the second, or the, yeah, the second largest owner of slot machines in the world outside the continental United States is the U.S. Department of Defense, because they're in every single base. So you, you've got to, you have to understand that, along with the mental health problems. Jurisdictional issues. Uh, in my jurisdiction, I ran a misdemeanor court with felony, a preliminary hearing jurisdiction. If it was charged as a felony, the guy or the right by us, and they never got a chance for an intervention. You have defendants that have charges in multiple courts, so we have to get judges to lift their detainers in the other courts with an agreement that we will report to them as to what happens with that defendant if we put them in a therapeutic court. It's a practical issue. Uh, it, with gambling, there's not a lot of viable inpatient and outpatient referral options. In the United States, not a lot of places you can send somebody. So. Gambling court is a progressive interface with the criminal justice system. These are the types of crimes. I'm not going to go over them. Just look at it this way. From the upper left going down and then up again to the bottom right, 
the, the highest prevalence case that we saw with gamblers was in the upper left. The lowest prevalence was in the lower right. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, to get in a therapeutic court, you couldn't have multiple felonies, couldn't have had any violent crime history, couldn't be a sex offender, and couldn't be a drug dealer. Uh, because those types of folks are not within the confines of what was being intended. Uh, we've talked a little bit about DSM-5. We found that the primary motivation for criminal behavior is not so much the money, it's to continue the action. And once we began to understand that, we could work with our agencies better. Now, if the message is not clear, we made mistakes a lot of ways over the last 13 years in terms of trying to learn. Uh, the risk factors, when we get people in is, in the courthouse, more severe problem gambling. We get late stage addiction in the courthouse. In other words, you can tell a drug addict or an alcoholic a lot earlier than you can tell a compulsive gambler. We have, people have problems with multiple forms of gambling. They owe debts to acquaintances. These are the kinds of people that come into the courthouse. A lot of concern about lethality. We lost a couple people to suicide during the 13 years and that was devastating to the staff. Excessive substance abuse and a lot of mental health overlay if it became serious and persistent, we were under an ethical con constraint to be able to refer them out for more thorough care in that area. Implications for treatment. If they were a severe problem gambler and were already into illegal behavior, a much more severe problem, a prognosis of a poorer outcome, they are more resistant to treatment uh, and may need more intense treatment in terms of how we approached it. Our court morphed from some traditional white collar or soft crimes, which I think, and I mentioned it the other day, is because when we first opened up gambling court, we didn't have the requisite experience to be able to know exactly what we were doing and what we were facing. We now are seeing a lot more drug-related crimes, more theft, burglary, more cocaine use. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but uh, I should mention it now. With the problem gamblers, we see a lot of cocaine. When they get to be pathological gamblers, it seems to change to alcohol and serious alcohol abuse. That was what our figures have shown. Much increased prevalence of minority women, uh, and I talked a little bit the other day about family systems theory and what, what the sensitivity of a court is not in terms of dealing with people in economically deprived areas with a whole different uh, racial set of standards and living confines. Uh, we found that the ones we weren't servicing the best were minority women so that we needed to change our program and bring pastors in and bring a lot of more support to see if we couldn't assist. Now in the traditional system gamblers are seen as hardcore criminals. Uh, there's an insensitivity to gambling. Prosecutors don't know anything about it. They don't want to know anything about it. They simply want to punish. They're not going to offer a plea to a compulsive gambler or somebody who's embezzled. Uh, the 70 year old lady is taking from the Rotary or the church is going to get a jail sentence probably much more readily than the heroin dealer. And the reason for that is, again, society's bias and the fact that prosecutors and judges are in the states tend to look at this as being a serious character flaw that needs to be punished. Uh, in our orientation, the traditional orientation, we have language in New York that allows superior court judges to refer even the most severe felony level drug users to a therapeutic program. That legislation came out a couple of years ago. It lacked one word, gambling. So the Superior Court judges had no authority to be able to do that, but they could with serious felony drug users who would have been otherwise subject to mandatory sentencing guidelines of anything from five to 15 years in jail. So again, the judicial myopia, the mandatory sentencing guidelines, plus the fact there's no systemic outlet in the traditional system to deal with those that have these types of problems. Uh, there's a whole bunch of factors in the United States, and they're listed here. We talk about the finances, the legislatures are not attuned to this. Politically, it's not a sexy issue. Society doesn't view gamblers as, uh, as uh, carefully or as, with as much mercy as they do with drug addicts and alcoholics. Now, in the traditional system, I usually look at this slide and I'll say, you go from the top down to the point where it says the defendant is sentenced. In the traditional system, that takes anywhere from four to five months to a year, during which there's no treatment being given, no intervention whatsoever. Uh, and even if they're referred for a gambling problem after, after probation looks at them and after they've sentenced them, there's really no follow-up, no monitoring to make sure they've, they're going to do it because 
it, in the States, probation, and I don't know what it's like here, there, there are wonderful people that are overworked and underpaid. And they have literally hundreds of cases, each one of them. And they, and they can't monitor them. So if you don't have the system on the front end to deal with it, you're not going to be able to deal with it on the back end. In the traditional system, uh, as I said before, the nature of the charge sets the course of it. There's not a lot of consideration of even sending compulsive gamblers to mental health courts. Mental health courts are accepted. Now we have DSM-5 giving it a mental health diagnosis. We still have prosecutors, most of them, being resistant to any kind of referral. In the traditional system, if the non-compliant defendant who's on probation doesn't go to the gambling program that was only identified if the probation officer asked the right questions, which is problematic in and of itself, then it would go back to the judge, there'd be a resentence and probably an incarceration. And incarceration doesn't offer much of anything to anybody. But that period of time from the violation of probation onward could have been more months. Again, no treatment and no intervention. These are two law review articles that talk about, in January 1999, the first 10 years of drug courts and the theory behind the fact that the recidivistic cycle of drugs crime jail or alcohol crimes jail or gambling crime jail uh, could just very honestly be broken. And the judges had the authority to do this and not hide behind the bench in their black robes, but basically be able to become proactive agents of change. Judge Peggy Hora, who I know has done some work here in New Zealand, uh, wrote another uh, law review article in the Georgia Law Review in 2008, talking again about the potentials for expansion of the entire concept. In the therapeutic system, what judges like myself have done, we arraign somebody on the initial charges, I will apply problem gambling in indicia, my experience from years of sitting on that bench and seeing what people might be more prone to be gambling offenders or not, and we assess them right up front. Then we send them for an evaluation down the hall the same day, where I have 12 or 15 certified screeners. They'll screen them for at the same time for drugs, for alcohol, for mental health, for gambling, and if they're a veteran, we have a representative of the VA that will tell them exactly what their VA benefits are, which I don't want to put it in terms of it's going to be a day at the beach for them. They still have to be responsible, but we found that veterans present that complicated picture. Then that defendant returns to court within 48 hours or a week at most with an individualized written recommendation for intervention, whether it be inpatient, outpatient, combination of mental health treatment, eventually vocational, educational, whatever it might be. That way, we approach it right up front. All that delay you saw on the previous slides, we try to get rid of it in a therapeutic court through an immediate referral. We have the prosecutors on the therapeutic team, and we have the judge adopting a therapeutic protocol. Uh, I will look at arraignment for the type of criminal activity. Is it petty larceny? Is it bad checks? Is it DWI? I'll begin to ask questions about what the past criminal record is, sometimes not a lot. As we, as we uh, matured in our operation in gambling court, we began to see more and more people with more of a criminal record. Psychosocial characteristics, their family set up, do they have a job, are they married? Are uh, there other reasons why they would be different than a typical criminal? Drug, alcohol, and mental health issues which go along with it. I will ask the defense attorney for credit reports and bank records. Uh, and basically, if they want that diversion for their client to get the benefit, then I'm gonna look at their records of what they've done at the casino and when they went to the ATM and things of that nature. So all of these things in and of themselves don't make the decision, but at least it's that very basic prima facie screening that allows me to send them to the folks who do it for a living and get an idea whether there's a gambler involved. And as I said, the full screen has everybody involved. We pursue cooperation. The team, not the court, but the team will go out and talk to their, their families, their business associates. We will look to see if there's need for mental health intervention. Sometimes the, the gamblers actually admit that they have a problem. Sometimes. Most of the time, not. And those of you who are in the treatment field know that I'm pro that's probably an understatement on my part. Uh, the initial screening is quick, generally semi-clinical. People are qualified to do it, but they're not doing it for purposes of diagnosis. It's an initial screen. It then goes out to an agency for a full screen for corroboration of what we think we're seeing. That person comes back within two weeks. Then the plea negotiations occur. If it's not already with a plea of guilty, well, I'll explain that. The district attorney and the, and the, and the defense counsel will speak with each other. My court is run on the post-plea basis. Pre-plea was get involved in the court. You do well. You graduate at the end of your min minimum year in the court. 
we'll give you a plea and you'll get no jail time and no sentence or no fine. Well, most of these people would say, after six or seven months, I don't want any more of this. And then the DA would come to me, as I've mentioned on many occasions to other people, and say, thanks, Judge, I have no witnesses now. I can't prosecute this case. I've got to dismiss it. So the cases now are post-plea. They take a plea to the highest charge. They know that they can get up to two years in jail. And they know if I refer them into the court, aside from being relapsed as part of recovery and having to understand that, if there's intentional noncompliance, they know I'm going to send them back to the criminal part and max sentence them. So they understand right up front what the penalty is for not, for not complying. Then they begin an individualized, as I mentioned, contractual, judicially monitored gambling recovery program. We look at the agencies where we can send them uh, in, in terms of whether they're going to get drug and alcohol treatment at the same time or mental health treatment, and this is, becomes critical and why we have court coordinators in our gambling court. One person stands at the bench and coordinates all the reports, but I have separate coordinators for gambling court, for veterans court, and for drug court. The idea of being able to have that funneling effect allows us to make choices on treatment, to look at the best agency for this person at any one particular time, and to have a coordinated approach. Defense counsel's role has changed over the period of years, the 20 years that I've been involved. Now we have a lot of lawyers that are buying in to shifting to a holistic concern. I, I want the best for my client, but I want my client to be alive, as opposed to the older approach was, I'm hired, I want a quick plea, I want a verdict, because I know, you know it's not my concern whether they're a drug addict, I don't care what they're doing, and by the way, I'll get them again in six months and it's another fee. So, uh, making that change has not been easy. I've taught myself and another judge taught a senior practicum at the law school. You can imagine the discussions that the young lawyers had about you know, not being able to fulfill their obligation for zealous advocacy. But we think we're getting defense counsel and the defense bar as partners in recovery, as part of this diversion. We have several tracks in our program. If you are got a slight abuse problem in gambling, something that's on the radar scope, you can go four weeks to three months, we outsource it, and they have to have periodic reports that come back to the court. But they don't have to be back as often. If they're a serious abuser, You'll be, see at the bottom of the page, they go to compliance court. They have to come and see the therapeutic courts coordinator once every two weeks and provide, and we get reports, and they need to assure that there's compliance. If they're a pathological gambler, there's a minimum of one year in the court, and they see me. It starts out every two weeks, every one, one week at a time for drug court, but every two weeks for gambling court. And as they begin to improve, they see me less frequently, which never disappoints them. And then we move on from there to the point of graduation. But we have different tracks because not everybody is the same. Uh, they return regularly because we assess their, their treatment compliance. If they're non-compliant, they're sanctions. They're motivated because somebody is regularly monitoring them, making them accountable, and part of the program is a psychosocial program, it's an educational program, it's vocational, as well as dealing through Gammonon, through Gamblers Anonymous, and all the components that will help them recognize their problem and deal with it. We also have, in addition to that mandatory orientation I spoke about, we have a mandatory replacement addiction session, which means every defendant in either drug court, gambling court, or veterans court has to go through at some point a session whereby we talk about how gamblers, if you take them off gambling, will go to drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol people will go to gambling because they're looking for that relief. And we found that if we take the time to educate people as to what the risks are for them, that we have a much better success rate. Sanctions, uh, sanctions increase as the non-compliance increases. This slide just go from top to bottom in increasing severity. In my court, I tended to avoid most of the first four or five went right to jail. Uh, but the, the participants in the court understood that, which is why a lot of them didn't like to see me frequently. But incentives. Uh, incentives can be very honestly, this is where it's fun because you can be really creative. Public encouragement and praise from the bench, here's that idea that it's almost like an AA, or AA meeting. Hugs, clapping, uh, basically getting in, I know some people are shaking their heads in a courtroom. You know, it, it's you know, sing, singing Kumbaya next, you know, but uh, <laughs> bottom line is that it does work because there's a connection with people. People like to know they have some worth. Now we have engraved, uh, uh, Medallions we give them after they finish clinical care. 
Once they finish the clinical care, they still got to be in the court for a number of months to be monitored, and then we graduate them. Uh, they have decreased frequency of court appearances, and graduation, you'll see another slide about it, but I'll explain it. My wife basically said, you got to have something that allows people to graduate with a sense of dignity, not with stigma. So as every other organization, we give them a certificate, but as I said the other day too, who the hell puts that up on the dining room wall? Uh, I graduated from drug court, look at that. Aunt Millie, look at it, look what I did. Uh, but we also give them the book, The Little Engine That Could, and I'll endorse the book to them. You know, I think I can, I think I can, I knew I could, and basically we have a very solemn ceremony for graduation, we'll have re uh, refreshments, we'll have them bring their families in, and when anybody graduates, they're required to give a speech and they're required to isolate one element of the program that help them find themselves. And what we do with that is not just have a small graduation, every participant in the program has to sit in the audience so that there is hopefully some pollination with regard to some of the ideas. Uh, as you see there, the other points are pretty self-explanatory. In the American system now, there's no excuse. This, the law still doesn't excuse criminality uh, involved because of uh, the genesis being gambling addiction, uh, but at least one federal court is using it as, in mitigation as part of their sentencing guidelines. Gambling court is a problem-solving court, but we're finding there's no grant money or funding available to intervene with gambling, and, and unfortunately even drug court judges are reluctant to take on the gambling court because it's, it's a lot of work. If you look at a therapeutic court, it's a hell of a lot more work than just running people in and out on a conveyor belt which is basically what some of the criminal courts are. So society looks in the United States as gambling is legal. It's not seen as a disease. It's a, a problem. Gambling is a character flaw. There's really not a lot of tools to break it down into, into severity. Uh, and there are certain rewards from it. Uh, there's cultural aspects to it. Uh, it's, it's social activity. It's easy money. We have all these slogans in New York State. If I had a million dollars, a dollar in a dream, I like the one particularly, you've got to be in it to win it. Now, that's a real motivation for young people to stay away from gambling. Uh, we basically had a lot of factors that came into play, most of which I will not go into now because I don't think it's germane to the time factor I have, uh, as to why we formed the court specifically at that time in western New York. But right now, we've seen that the issues all across the country are the same. And judges are waiting for official approval. Now, you're finding that drug court judges, as I said, are le less willing to do it. There's more bureaucratic overlay, uh, but again, government's not buying into it, and that's the issue that has to happen before funding will take place. Our screening, as I said before, is multifaceted in terms of covering the waterfront. We have it as a programmatic approach and a team approach. We have 31, when I left, we had 31 defendants in gambling court. To give you an idea of the difficulty with identification, we have 460 in drug court such that it's real tough to identify gamblers. They're not about to wear a sign saying, I am a gambler. And so as a result, it takes a lot of work, and that, that really comes to bear as to what, what are we doing with it and how do we work with our screening tools. Our components of our program involve counseling for mental health, substance abuse, DV, family, consumer debt. Uh, we have Gamblers Anonymous, Gammonon. We screen every three months, at least to have some substantive basis to look at how well they're doing, and there's a 16-week psychotherapy group. We talked about the two mandated sessions each, each participant has to go through. This is the psychoeducational component. 16 weeks, they focus on, among other things, the signs of a gambling problem, the phases that goes through, and the phases of treatment, dealing with triggers and urges, managing time and money. This program has had a lot of positive feedback from the people involved, much to my surprise because I thought they'd just sit there and hold their breath. But it's the first time somebody actually worked with them in a workshop setting to help them understand their own problem. Graduation, we did talk about. And that's something that's dear to our hearts in these programs. These are our statistics for what they're worth in drug court. Uh, a little over 6,000 participants since I started drug court, graduated about 4,100. There's our success rate. And as I say at every one of these presentations, the biggest one that we're proud of is 39 crack-free babies, because that is an amazing burden on those who are born with that problem. Our caseload, if you add the 283 and you add the 139, that's what's in drug court. And the fact, you might ask, how many, why are so many people on warrant? Well, that's part of the problem, part of the addiction. DV court is much less successful in the sense that 
you're dealing with people that are very difficult to re-educate, meaning domestic violence abusers. Uh, we have screenings, we've been screening for, and we've kept statistics on this, about 18 point something percent of our total screens in drug court isolate some form of gambling problem or identification or something that needs more inquiry. And I find that the 18 percent is a pretty large number considering that society says it's only about 95 or 96 percent that have, uh, that are fine and only three or four percent that have really gambling problems within the community. Uh, we've had 135 that were pathological gamblers, 92 of them have uh, graduated through the program, and we had, I believe, eight that didn't work well. I'll take those statistics of about 90 percent of our graduates any day of the week, considering that before therapeutic courts took vogue, the success rate was about 45 to 50 percent. This is our demographics. I'm running short on time, so I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, you can see it's primarily a, a male-oriented court, primarily uh, a white court, primarily you'll see a little bit more income, employment, high school education than you would see with a normal criminal population. The 43 percent that gambled before 18 is significant. The 78 percent that gambled before 21 again shows what happens as we begin to have full page ads in newspapers glorifying the people that win Texas Hold'em. And we tell all our youth that sex, power, money, and glory is how well you do in the casino. And that is the message that's coming out. Uh, the 17 and a half percent of veterans that we have that have problems is a growing statistic. Again, typifying what I talked about before. Uh, this is the type of, of activities. The average DSM scores were 7.3. Our, our average time to completion as we run some people through who've been there for a while is 11.8 months, but now it's mandatory to be there at least a year. Some of the more serious heroin addicts have been there with me as long as four years. Programmatic recognitions, growing caseload. Our court was limited to misdemeanor crimes. Uh, we recognize that the higher level crimes of higher embezzlement, grand larceny, credit card fraud, and the like we're going to the Superior Court, but we've had working relationships with the Superior Court to have these cases sent down on the condition there would be no plea in the Superior Court or no positive sentencing consideration unless they successfully graduated from our court. Our age range we found was 21 to 30, running up through 50 as far as problem and pathological gambling. We saw a direct connection between the emergence of casinos and the amount of people that are actually being screened and having some problem. As I said, cocaine tends to be what our statistics have shown that the serious abusers are, are using. And as they become fully, fully invested pathological gamblers with the, at the end stage of dependence, they're very honestly very heavy alcohol users. We do have, as I said, superior court referrals. We're having, we see increase in minority population. We are on the positive side having fewer warrants for people not coming to court because we oriented them to begin with and told them what we expect. You wouldn't think that it'd have an effect with a criminal defendant, but it does. We know that the bench and the bar needs to be more aware of the program nationally and regionally as well as buy-in by the prosecution. We constantly have to look at our identification tools. We have to be sensitive to the drugs and alcohol and domestic violence, mental health all the time. We've noted an increase in abuse population, uh, and we have different tracks that I talked about. As we've been in existence more, we've become more sophisticated to a certain degree. The point that I've raised here is that we're dealing with the Native American community, the spirituality and the cultural component was absolutely essential. And the Maori population here, having such a tremendous respect for culture and for spirituality, makes it a perfect population to be able to deal with as well as the rest of the population in terms of, of a success in this type of court. Uh, we have found that even with minority populations, we, we leaned upon their community structure, their religious structure, their pastors to help us with people that had significant problems. Uh, we have found obstacles. And the obstacles, if you don't recognize your obstacles, you're never going to have any success. Systemic and societal awareness and recognition of even the need to do this with gambling. Screening and identification problems. Multiple co-occurrent addictions. You can read down the list. We have to stabilize mental health. Defendants, here's a real shocker, they actually manipulate as gamblers. Family involvement and enabling. 
prosecutorial resistance, defense counsel that still don't buy into therapeutics, lack of facilities to send people to, and monitoring of relapse and rearrest and measuring what success is. Uh, there's no coverage in the United States for gambling. Unless defense counsel takes them in and says, tell them you have a drug or alcohol problem, then you get in the front door. And then maybe you'll get some mental health treatment, uh, which might relate to what your gambling issues are. Uh, monitoring, we try to look at the fact that there's no way we can stand in front of somebody and say, you know, it's like drug court. We have a P test. No, we don't. We don't have anything that substantively shows that the person's recovered. So we use a lot of factors. Explaining at the onset through orientation. Working with our treatment agencies to monitor personality compliance and life activity changes while they're in treatment. Uh, periodic drug and alcohol uh, testing because we mandate no drugs and alcohol while in gambling court. Random credit report checks. Self-exclusion. More frequency in coming to court. Home visits collaterals, and up with the Evergreen Council in the state of Washington beginning to embark on a strategy of using voice stress analysis to measure whether certain people have or have not relapsed. We've seen a lot of increase in co-incurring disorders, but I think they were there all along. It's just we weren't smart enough to pick up on it. And as far as future things, we're adopting and new, using new screening tools. All of these we use, plus amalgaming various portions of each one in an effort to stay ahead of what the defendant will say or not say in terms of subjective answers. New screening approach, we educate right before they're screened. We screen along with all the other measures that we look at. Uh, we have mandatory education groups. We have the replacement addiction, and we rescreen. Again, the idea of constant checks and balances to see if you're actually accomplishing anything. Uh, more effective tools I've already mentioned. More sophisticated staff training more retreats, more exposure to what the addiction is, what the experts are saying about it, and strategies for dealing with people. The integration of spiritual and cultural, and our collaboration with other courts. They'll send defendants to us in terms of gambling, and we'll send mental health people to them if they're running a mental health court because I wasn't running one. Uh, improved communication with defense counsel. Identification and utilization of inpatient gambling treatment facilities. One or two more are opening in the state of New York, and hopefully they'll get a lot of our business in terms of usage. Empirical and evidence-based research. There's a dearth of it in this particular uh, profession. We need more of it. Just as was mentioned by the keynote speaker this morning, we have to have evidence-based research to get the funding, to get the buy-in, to get the politicians to buy into it. Of course, grant funding is absolutely essential, and certainly right now it's stressed. Our courts live on early identification, mandated treatment, the key element of judicial supervision, and development of healthy behaviors. We expect the problem to grow exponentially, so we have to be prepared to deal with it. Public outreach into government, working on legislative matters, getting a recognition of our results in gambling court, expanding, getting on the docket, as I've suggested here, get on the docket of your judicial continuing education program here in New Zealand so that other judges can be exposed to what therapeutics have to offer, and you can make it part of something they hear from another judge. That way, it has a chance of working. Networking between the superior and the lower courts to promote effective dealing with people of this nature, enhancing our protocols, uh, better outreach, getting more providers interested in dealing with gambling treatment, because there's not many of them that do, and understanding success. What is success? Does it mean total stoppage, as it is in my court, of any form of the addiction, or does it just mean minimization? Some courts approach it differently, so as a result, you have to define what your success basis is so you can have some chance of working with it in the future. And follow up in the, as far as post-adjudication. Around the world, acceptance of a disease-based model, acceptance of the fact that you can have a program under judicial supervision, and fostering awareness of the societal benefit, both individually society for quality of life and for protection, and financially, in terms of what it costs the society to deal with people. And they just shut me off, so I'm done. Thank you very much, everybody.